as, as you may know, malaria is one of the main um, clinical concerns nowadays. And um, the transmitter of the disease is, um, is a mosquito of the genus Anopheles. But the causing agent, which is what Anopheles um, injects into the human, is a protist, a unicellular uh, protist called plasmodium, which uh, hides uh, inside uh, the red blood cells in the blood. And then I was asked when giving this presentation to, to explain a little bit what the nanomalaria unit is. And then uh, taking this image, we are a little bit, uh, have been hidden inside the back uh, since the beginning. Actually, we were one of the founding uh, research lines in the back back in 2002. And we entered the lab for the first time with Gabriel Gomila, and we did the first pipetting. So if somebody wants uh, the original pipette for a Yvec museum, we have it in the lab. And since then, we have been um, uh, granted space by different uh, people in the event during the first five years. It was Fausto Sant who gave us a space. And then it was uh, Josep Samitier. And since uh, three years, three years back, we uh, this research agreement between Yvette and Crescid was signed because at that point we reached um, um, a state in our research where we needed we needed to go to a preclinical assays or thinking about preclinical assays, and then here um, we thought maybe it's it's too technological and we would need to be closer to a to a clinical institute and this is what Crescid does they they work with uh, diseases of poverty like like um, malaria but also chagas leishmaniasis and aids and this is where we are now so we belong to both institutes although sometimes i have the feeling that we don't belong to any of them <laughs> we pass evaluations uh, for both of them and we will continue like that for as long as, as uh, i guess as uh, both parts have a, a mutual interest and in this case it's essential that Yvette has an interest in doing uh, nanomalaria applied uh, or nanomedicine applied to malaria, which is not so common. These are the, these two words I highlighted here. And um, our application of nanomedicine to malaria is it's, also, it's obviously a, a scientific uh, objective, but it's also a personal commitment because when one hears the word nanomedicine, you always think of uh, diseases prevalent in the developed world, like Alzheimer or cancer, but you don't think of nanomedicine as something that can be applied to diseases of uh, developing countries, because there is the wrong assumption that nanomedicine is something expensive, and, and then uh, it cannot be for those who cannot pay it. And then we think this this is wrong, and there are two ways to fight against this. One, one way, it's uh, outside of our reach, which is um, if you can develop a medicine that can be used to treat, uh, uh, for instance, malaria, which, is, uh, which has to be deployed in very poor countries in Africa, let's say. Here, the public um, entities or private companies have to put something from their part so that it cannot be, uh, so the cost of the medicine cannot be an issue. If, if you can cure a disease, it doesn't matter how expensive uh, that cure is, it has to be applied. We cannot say no, this is too expensive, we cannot apply it there. <coughs> On this, we don't have any influence, obviously, as researchers, but uh, we do have influence on how we do our research. And then, what I will try to explain today are our efforts in designing nanomedicines for malaria, which uh, are highly efficient, so we don't want to lose efficacy, we don't want to do something cheaper that doesn't work that well. It has to work as well as the most expensive uh, uh, prototypes, but we must do it as, as economically affordable as, as possible, and this is uh, our job. Okay, so now um, let's go a little bit to, to, the, to the scientific uh, talk. 
Um, I have divided it in three parts, of the, which um, the first one is a, a very short overview of something we did uh, some years ago, which is uh, where we started with malaria in the development of nanovectors uh, for the biodiscovery of new antimalarial drugs. And after that, this is where we are today in the development of methods to deliver those or other new future antimalarial drugs to the target cells. And finally, I will present what, our, what are our plans for the future, and, and also my idea was trying to explore possible future collaborations within uh, the IBEC. Um, very briefly, this is, um, I will try to explain the uh, life cycle of, of the malaria parasite, which, as I mentioned, it develops into hosts. One is the human, and another is the mosquito. And uh, let's start with the mosquito biting a human where it injects into the blood a type of, of uh, a form of the parasite, which is the sporozoite, that goes very quickly to the liver. The, any form of the malaria parasite is very fragile and cannot survive outside of a cell uh, which is parasitizing for more than a couple of minutes. So it always takes about this time uh, to reach the, the liver, where it uh, stays for a while, and depending on the species, it can take several days or weeks or even months until it develops and enters the blood circulation. And then in the blood, it starts uh, the erythrocytic cycle, which is where it spends most of its time. This cycle, again, it can take uh, 24 hours or, or three or four days, depending on the species. And this can go on uh, essentially forever until the person uh, uh, eventually dies or it develops a, a slight immunity, but uh, usually the person never cures by itself. Either you have it chronic or, or you die. And in this uh, red blood cell cycle, the parasite goes to several stages and eventually it develops into gametocytes, some of them, and these gametocytes are in the human blood waiting for another mosquito to bite. And if this other mosquito bites and takes some gametocytes, then these cells, when they detect a drop in temperature and then they, they know they have left the human body and they are in the insect body, they develop into gametes and fecundation takes place in the mosquito and then it develops a, a special type of cell, which is a okinid, and from there, again, mirozoites develop, go to the mosquito salivary glands and start again the cycle. It's, it's a very complex cycle, and the parasite has uh, many strategies to escape immune uh, control <laughs> and to escape uh, spleen clearance and, and uh, renal clearance, and it's a very uh, tricky parasite. And the thing I, I didn't mention, but which is important for the physiology of the disease, is uh, that the uh, mosquito that bites, it's always a female. And then there is this uh, cartoon by Gary Larson. He is a, a well-known uh, drawer of cartoons, always showing animals. And in this particular one, you, you don't see it from the back of the room. This is a mosquito house, and there is um, uh, the, um, the woman mosquito waiting there and the mosquito man comes top tired after a whole day of working, and he says, what a day, I must have spread malaria across half the country, and this is wrong. And actually, when Gary Larson published this cartoon, immediately he got thousands of letters complaining that this is not true, that it was the, the female who, who does the biting. Okay, in, in this very complex cycle, all the pathologies of malaria come from this uh, erythrocytic cycle. It's, it's when the blood cell bars and releases uh, parasites that have to infect again uh, another red blood cell that uh, lots of proteins from the parasite are in the blood. And this is what brings the fever and the incapacitation of malaria. Then because of that, virtually all current drugs are against these forms. But um, now other drugs are starting to be, uh, to be uh, searched for the other forms of the parasite. One of the most promising avenues is 
uh, always when you have to develop a new drug is to target um, a metabolic activity that is present in the, in the pathogen, but it's not present in the human. And then this is the case for a metabolic route which uh, synthesizes uh, IPP, isopentanyl diphosphate, which is an essential intermediate of isoprenoid biosynthesis, like for instance of cholesterol, which uh, is an essential component of all membranes. And then if you block cholesterol biosynthesis in any uh, being, like in plasmodium, the animal or the, the being dies immediately. Uh, we synthesize, we humans synthesize mevalonate, like all animals, through a pathway which is completely different. Uh, well, sorry, the mevalonate pathway is what we use to synthesize IPP. And uh, plasmodium has a completely different pathway based on other enzymes and substrates, which is called the methyl erythritol phosphate pathway, meth pathway. And uh, this is so because it's found in a special organelle, which is called the apicoplast, that is very similar to a plant chloroplast that, that plasmodium took from, a, from a, as a symbiont some millions of years ago. But the point is that some of the enzymes that are synthesized here are essential for the parasite. So we took this as a model and we decided to look for, uh, to design nanobiosensors that could allow us to identify new uh, inhibitors that would improve current methods. Usually if you want to find an enzyme inhibitor, what you do it is uh, as a, an assay where you uh, have your enzymatic assay, there is pro where there is production of a, of a product that gives color, and then you detect that color. And the problem with that is the sensitivity is not very high. And then we thought that by applying single molecule force spectroscopy, and, uh, and if we could maybe study single molecule interactions between an enzyme and the substrate, because all this takes place in liquid, maybe we could detect inhibitors here. So I, I will not explain all the details, but I will show you there to the, the final prototype, where we uh, bound to the AFM cantilever one of the enzymes from that metabolic route, and uh, to the substrate, uh, to the surface, we uh, bound one of the substrates, and then we checked that there, there was adhesion at the single molecule level. We could detect the binding of the enzyme to the substrate. And here you have a histogram indicating the binding forces. Once we could see that there was a, a good interaction, what we did was to add a, a known inhibitor of the enzyme in solution. And we simply checked at which dilution we could detect this inhibitor. And by doing this, we could improve by about two orders of magnitude the current enzymatic assays, which was good. Uh, but still we have the disadvantages of AFM, which is relatively expensive and it's an artisanal method, so it's very slow. But the, the idea is there and maybe someday we can continue maybe uh, really trying to find in a, in a natural extract some, some new inhibitors because so far we just did this proof of concept with, with a well-known inhibitor. Okay, after doing that and spending some time on, on this very basic research approach, we decided to advance towards uh, an, an applied work and we started to look for methods for, for the targeted delivery of antimalarial drugs. And here, uh, the idea is not ours, it was Paul Ehrlich, more than 100 years ago, who first defined the concept of magic bullet in the sense of something that you could direct specifically to your target cell or tissue and not to the cell or tissue next door. And in that way, you could uh, have a very high efficacy of, of drugs. And this idea must have been uh, very popular at the time because in the 50s, there was even a movie made about, about this uh, doctor and this idea, which was called Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet. So if, if sometime you, you see the movie, I think it, it's an interesting one to watch. Actually, the first magic bullet developed by Ehrlich was methylene blue, which is an antimalarial drug. And, and methylene blue was uh, one of the first antimalarials used in the Second World War, in the Pacific uh, War where it was used 
against malaria in the Pacific Islands, but it was discontinued actually because of uh, aesthetic reasons, because the soldiers didn't like that methylene blue gave to the, to the sclera, to the white in the eyes, a blue color, and the urine was green, and they said, we don't like this, so it was, it was not, used, not used anymore because of that. And the second compound that Ehrlich tried was called a compound 606, which ended its days as a, as a, a drug for uh, syphilis. And, and again, with the movie uh, analogy, if you remember, when Meryl Streep gets syphilis in North of Africa, she goes back to Denmark to be treated with, with Salvarsan, which is uh, this anti-malaria. Okay, what are the advantages of a targeted drug delivery strategy? There are two very clear. One is that if you can give overall doses which are lower, you have less side effects. If you have an, a non-specific drug, you have to give usually very high levels, and this has a lot of side effects. If you can decrease overall doses, that's good. And if you can locally increase to very high levels the delivery of drugs to the pathogen, that will contribute to kill the pathogen more quickly, and this will reduce resistances. And this is probably the main objective in a targeted drug delivery strategy is to reduce the appearance of resistance by the parasites. And the combination of those two ideas brings a third conclusion, which is that maybe uh, you could then rescue some orphan drugs that have been suspected to be very good, for instance, anti-malarials, but which cannot be used because of their, of their high uh, unspecific toxicity. Then, as I mentioned, the, the target was the red blood cell because of, of the reasons I said before. And our, in the beginning, we designed, uh, we, we thought, what can be the, uh, the, the ideal nanovector? And then we, de we defined some steps. Some of them would be unavoidable, and some of them might be avoided. But there are two essential steps, which whatever you design has to have a specific targeting towards the target cells. So it, somehow it has to bind to those cells and not to healthy cells. But this is not enough and because binding, and if the drug remains outside, that's no good. So besides binding, the drug has to be injected inside the target cell. Those are the two unavoidable points I mentioned before. And in the case of malaria, because the parasite is hidden behind several membranes, there is a back wall and then there is the, the own uh, membrane, plasma membrane of the parasite. And if you have to target, for instance, the apicoplast, you might have to go through different membrane systems. You might need to have something more complex, like a, a kind of molecular Russian doll, where you enter one barrier, then comes out a second doll, which enters another barrier and so on. But this for malaria is not practical. But when, when we first, if you go to a pharma company and present them with this idea, they say, forget it, uh, is what I mentioned in the beginning. <coughs> Uh, you have to find something uh, much cheaper than that because obviously this system, which would involve many uh, targeting molecules and many different nanocapsules, would be very expensive for malaria. So if with the two first steps uh, it works, that would be very nice. This is, uh, let's see if it works. This is the way we do all our in vitro assays. Whenever we try a new nanovector, the first thing we do is an in vitro assay to see that that the targeting is good. And here, schematically, I show you uh, how all our nanovectors are. Uh, this is a liposome, but uh, the scheme is the same for, for in all cases. There is always a capsule, uh, which in, in this case is a liposome, which contains the drug, which is schematically are these pink bits here. And this capsule with the drug has uh, some type of targeting molecule. In this case, it's a half antibody. And then we add this to a, a co-culture of healthy red blood cells and of plasmodium infected red blood cells. And you can see the infected ones because they stain with DAPI, which is a DNA stain, because the red blood cell doesn't have a uh, nucleus. And then if this works, when we add the nanovectors here, you will see a red color, which is the fluorescent content. And essentially, 
we wait for mm -hmm. one, one and a half hours. The cells are alive. They, they have been freshly uh, obtained, and this is essential. And then we look then for the targeting molecule and for our uh, nanovector content. And the objective is to find what, uh, when we find this in an experiment, then we give the OK, and we try to proceed to, to the in vivo. And, and the result, which is shown here, is after doing that assay with living cells, you fix everything, and then you look in, in the microscope. And here you have a field with several dozens of red blood cells, and there is only one that is infected. And we know this because there is the only one which has DNA. And this only one cell is also the one that gets the targeting antibody and the one that gets inside the content, which in, in this case were quantum dots. And we, we must reach this, this step. We must find 100% efficacy in both ways. One is targeting all the infected cells and not targeting a single healthy cell. And then when this happens, we, we proceed to, to other steps. One important step is that's very nice, everything uh, works, but that was in a, uh, in a Petri dish where we only have red blood cells. When you inject that in a mice, for instance, you will have many other cells. Um, um, lymphocytes are usually not a problem because they're relatively few. And in one and a half hours, we have seen that they don't quantitatively remove much of, of the nanovector. Endothelial cells might be more a problem because endothelial cells are forming the blood vessels and there are many more. And then what we always do is uh, the same experiment as before, but we first make a culture of endothelial cells, which are this one here, for instance. You can see it has a nucleus. And then when they are almost confluent, we add uh, plasmodium infected red blood cells. And here, this one here indicated by the arrow is, is a plasmodium infected <coughs> red blood cell. We repeat the experiment and then we must see that quantitatively, as is the case here, all the content of the nanovector goes to the red blood cell and very little, if any, to the endothelial cell. That's our next check. Okay, let's proceed to the next step. This is not yet a mice. This is still a Petri dish. In the mice, um, um, what, what uh, might happen is that because there is a, a spleen and there is a liver and there, is, uh, there are kidneys, the nanovectors might be removed. So we must be sure that they are not. And then we always inject into the blood of a mouse uh, the fluorescent nanovector, for instance. And then we remove blood at different times. And we must see that at least for one and a half hours, which is the time that the in vitro experiment takes place, that all the nanovectors are in blood, which is the case. We have about uh, 85 or 90 percent. And even after six hours, there is still half of the nanovector in the blood of, of the mouse. So that's OK. Then, um, OK, everything is wonderful. And that means that uh, did we already find the, the magic bullet against malaria? <coughs> And now we don't know if the next animation will work. <laughs> this is the, the next movie thing. This is from Jurassic Park, as you know. Obviously, it's, this is not, not like that. <coughs> it's very different to load your nanovector with, uh, with a fluorescent thing. That, and you see that some fluorescence goes to the target cell from uh, filling it with an anti-malarial drug and seeing that, that you kill the parasite. Uh, we used in, in this experiment uh, chloroquine, which is the most potent anti-malarial drug. And, and a free chloroquine at this concentration kills, it's very much below the IC50, so it, it kills only about 10% of the parasites. And with our nanosystem, by, uh, with the immunoliposomal nanovector, if you add enough uh, targeting antibody, you uh, reach the point where you improve. Uh, this goes only to, to 50, uh, which, which is five times. But we can completely eliminate parasitemia just by adding sufficient uh, antibody and by adding sufficient uh, liposome to the Petri dish. That's not a problem. We can do that. But uh, this is not enough, because then when you compare the volume that you have to add to the Petri dish and translate it to, uh, to a human, 
we should inject uh, about uh, a liter of, of something to kill the, the same amount of, of parasites. So this is no good. One of the reasons is that the antibody, it's not the best antibody. It only recognizes uh, the uh, parasite in, in the late uh, phases of the blood cycle. Most of the, of the blood cycle is what is called the ring stage. And then after uh, about the half of the cycle, a new form appears, which is a trophocyte. And then our targeting antibody was against trophocyte and, and against the next form, which is the shysa. Then that means that it enters very late into this into the cycle, and it doesn't have probably time to to kill. And another reason is that probably we are not adding enough enough drug, so we must find something which can encapsulate larger amounts. Uh, the in vivo assays, they are not that bad, taking into account this. Uh, we, we have done already some in vivo assays, and we clearly improve the, uh, the efficacy of the free drug, but still we don't reach 100% uh, efficacy. So uh, clearly we are still very far from, from a, a working prototype, and especially if you take into account uh, the cost, this is what, what we said at the beginning. It cannot be that expensive. It can uh, 51 euros to eliminate, in this case, uh, half of the parasitemia from a liter of blood. We did that calculation. This is very far from, from ideal. And uh, always the pharma companies, they tell you, bring me something that can, in a single dose, wipe out all the parasites for less than a dollar. And then uh, this is still uh, far away. So how far are we from, from this magic bullet? It's a long road, but we think it's worth it. That, that's why we are in here. We must uh, find better drugs. This is something clear. Better targeting. The antibody is not uh, good enough. We must be able to deliver increased drug amounts. And uh, for malaria today, the liposome is very restricted to a uh, to a parental administration, and then we need something which can be administered in an, in an oral form, because in most of the places where you find malaria today, there are no hospitals, and you must be able to give pills to people. And then everything has first to pass through 100% efficacy in a mice, in a mouse model. And probably, as, as we will mention at the end, we could try to find new targets, which are not red blood cells, and we could maybe find new applications like to vaccines or to other diseases. The idea from here, which is what we are doing today, is to take this prototype as a, a kind of, of Lego game where we have these three parts in the component, the capsule, the drug, and the targeting agent, and we exchange them and we try to assemble a, a better prototype. We can find better targeting antibodies. The one we are using, it's against a protein which is mostly intracellular, and that's why probably we don't have a, a good result. We are trying to work with antibodies that are predominantly on the periphery of the cell. That's uh, something that could improve results. Antibodies are not that good because, especially in malaria, where the parasite, one of the strategies that it uses to uh, escape immune clearance is to change very quickly uh, the proteins that it exposes to the outside. And for that reason, uh, drugs for malaria, they lose efficacy very quickly. And for that reason also, any targeting antibody will have to be changed very, very fast. Uh, then an alternative to antibodies are DNA aptamers, as you know, uh, uh, single-stranded nucleic acids, they fall into 3D structures that give uh, shapes that actually they are very much like the antigen recognition uh, parts of an antibody, with the advantage that aptamers can be uh, uh, synthesized in a much cheaper way and they can be found in a much faster way than antibodies. Then this, there is a very uh, well-known method to purify aptamers against specific cell types, and we are trying to, to find some specific uh, aptamers against plasmodium-infected red blood cells with the idea of simply substituting uh, the uh, antibody by the aptamer. Obviously, also, 
new drugs. This is simply taking uh, any uh, new drugs that are appearing and putting them into your uh, nanovectors. They can be either hydrophobic, uh, and you can place them maybe in the liposome by layer or hydrophilic inside. Um, again, um, another um, drug that can be used is something which maybe you don't think of it as, as a drug, but just by looking in the literature, you can find interesting uh, options like heparin, which 30 years ago was described to have antimalarial activity, but because, as you know, it's also a hemorrhagic uh, compound, it was never used uh, as a malaria treatment. But recently, some suggestions uh, have uh, mentioned that by cleaving heparin and having smaller fragments, it loses uh, hemorrhagic activity. And also by binding it to, to a surface, it, it's not so uh, hemorrhagic. And then we have been working with different types of uh, heparins and heparin-like molecules. And we have uh, uh, identified that it's true. Uh, heparin has a very specific targeting towards plasmodium infected red blood cells. And then we think it can work as a dual element or as a synergic element working both as a, as a targeting uh, molecule, if we bind it to positively charged liposomes very easily, and we can maybe add this targeting uh, option to the antimalarial activity. And um, <coughs> uh, a lot of hope is in a molecule similar to heparin that we are exploring, which are found in marine organisms which are also antimalarial, but they do not have this uh, hemorrhagic activity. So this is also an interesting avenue to explore. And then everything we have been doing now is based in, in the liposome. And then we think the liposome works as, as it is described here, where uh, it fuses uh, <coughs> with a red blood cell by a physical process, which is membrane fusion, and then it delivers inside the corresponding antimalarial drug. This is how uh, most likely it works. But then um, liposome is, is just um, a type of nanovector. And then as in our solar system, you have seen from, from away, you might think that all the planets are more or less the same. So you, you think all our day, uh, uh, rounded shapes, but when you look closely, you see that this is not true. And then we have the outer giant gas planets like Jupiter and Saturn. We have the rocky inner planets like the Earth. We have a small satellites. There is a whole different uh, family of planets. And then in our nanoparticle system, there is also a whole different um, family of nanoparticles that we can use. One is certainly liposomes. But there are also uh, polymeric structures like dendrimers and synthetic or natural polymers. There are uh, metallic nanoparticles, if you want to use them. There are micelles. And even we have the idea that, that nanomedicine is something, a very new addition to, to our uh, therapeutic arsenal. But actually, the first um, therapeutic antibodies, a single molecule, can also be a type of nanomedicine if, if there is a specific targeting and if there is a, a, some type of therapeutic action. So we are trying uh, different uh, new uh, nanoparticles, like protocells, which were described in a cancer context. Protocells have the capacity, because they have an inner silicon oxide core, that can absorb large quantities of, of drugs. And then the idea is that drugs in these uh, uh, protocells can be concentrated very much. And this uh, might give one of the options, which is delivering more antimalarial drug. Uh, we are also working with dendrimeric uh, micelles, which are uh, a type of uh, polymers that are grown uh, to very regular shapes and that you can also use to encapsulate drugs and to deliver drugs to, uh, to red blood cells. And here I will not go into the de details, but our idea was to take these new types of nanocapsules as simply 
an encapsulating entity, but we thought we might have to add still a targeting antibody. But we are finding that this is not true. And some of these uh, polymers by themselves, like here, you, you see here again, several red blood cells, and there is only one which is infected. And these polymers, without having to add any type of targeting molecule, the, the structure of the polymer somehow is targeted to these cells. And the same is for other types of polymeric uh, structures, which are not uh, dendrimeric. And again, we are finding, interestingly, this characteristic that many types of polymer, they have a, a specific targeting to uh, the plasmodium infected uh, red blood cell. And the way the polymers work is uh, a little bit different because uh, we do not have here a membrane. So the polymers, what they do is they just go across the, the cell membrane. They don't even uh, um, enter through a, a vesicle pathway because here is uh, by electron microscopy, if you follow the fate of these polymers inside the cell, you see that where they locate, there is not a, a lipid by layer, so they just go to the membrane, and even they uh, they go to the parasite itself. They somehow they cross all the membranes without any targeting molecule, and they, they go to the parasite itself. And we think they can be used as, as one of, of these well-known Trojan horses, that we could maybe uh, use them to deliver drugs directly to the parasite. And well, we are now already here with, uh, with uh, animal assays, and uh, with the polymers, there is a, a good prospect because here we have uh, reached a point where we can eliminate half of the parasitemia for a cost of only 50 cents. It's not still eliminating all the parasitemia in vivo, but we are getting closer to what, what we wanted. And uh, things for the future, if the conditions are right and, and if we find the, the right uh, collaborations, one obvious thing to explore is this mysterious capacity for the red blood cell to uh, incorporate specifically uh, these different polymers. Heparin, polymers, uh, polyamidomine derived, or dendrimers. And because of this, this wide spectrum, they are all very different, we think it cannot be just a receptor. And then it must be some type of mechanical property of the red blood cell in the sense that maybe if we could study more in detail the, the membrane mechanics of plasmodium infected red blood cell, we can find out why this, this happens and then maybe we can design better targeting molecules, which because they are not based on the detection of individual proteins, but they would be based probably on the detection of, of membrane properties, maybe then this can have a, a, a lasting uh, uh, use. And, and we can also find, try to find better targets. The infected red blood cell is the best case scenario because in a, in a human infected with malaria, we might have up to a trillion red blood cells and then eliminating all of them with a single dose, I think is impossible. There are other alternatives. This is a, a scheme of the, of the cycle of plasmodium and these are the cell numbers. And if you remember, I mentioned in the beginning the gametocytes and the gametes and the all kinid. And of those, there are many, many less. Like in the case of the, of the uh, forms in the mosquito, there are as few as two, three, four, five cells. The problem is that they are in the mosquito. And then you have few cells, but you have a lot more of, of uh, mosquitoes flying around. But anyway, it's an interesting uh, challenge to think about nanomedicines that might be uh, uh, designed to target an insect with the final goal of curing malaria in humans. If you, the idea is to cure the mosquito, but uh, this is not a very well-developed idea. Another path we started to walk is the study of uh, cerebral malaria, which is one of the main concerns. When you have cerebral malaria, it's very common that there is no cure and, and you die. Uh, probably because of the obstruction of, of the thin brain capillaries, but there is also the suspicion that plasmodium can maybe disrupt the blood-brain barrier, and then there is a, a, a field to explore 
Here we had uh, an in vitro blood brain barrier that we prepared. And uh, these are plasmodium uh, infected red blood cells that we added. And our idea is to see if we can see some disruption of the barrier, because it's not clear yet if the parasite can even enter the brain in cerebral malaria. And there is a, a huge field to explore here. And finally, this is probably, if I have to choose what I want to do until the end of my career, which is not that far, we are always talking about the magic bullet and, and then with the idea that the magic bullet is something that goes directed to David because you are the, the disease cell, but this is not true. So the, uh, the nanovector is just floating around and it bumps uh, randomly against everybody, and when it bumps against the, the target cell, then um, it, it, that's what it's called the magic bullet, but this is not true. Ideally, we should try to find something that you inject that into the body, and then it sees the target cell from away, and it goes actively towards it. And then I have no idea, obviously, how this can be done, but as a first proof of concept, which we always start in that way. I think the strategy must be some type of molecular gradient. I don't see any other, any other possibility. There are molecules that are uh, released by a type of cell and not by others, and there is a gradient. So can we maybe design some type of nanovector that goes actively in the direction of that growing gradient? I don't know. We have some ideas, but this is something that might involve several IVEC groups, but it, it might be an interesting thing to do. In any case, this is the last slide. Uh, whatever it is, uh, let's call them uh, Russian dolls or Trojan horses or Lego, we really think, and, and that's why we are here, still existing, that nanomedicine can be an option for diseases of poverty. And, and the objective is to continue working on that. And these are the people who have in the last year, most actively collaborating in what I have explained to you today. And thank you very much.